professor. How are digital technologies impacting in human memory, language practice and forms? Um, I think that uh, digital memory, uh, or what I would call global memory, um, which is this coming together of digitization and digital practices with globalization, is, is radically altering human memory in many different ways. Um, first of all, in terms of the practices that we're engaged in, largely they're already becoming unconscious. So, for example, if you forget a name of somebody and you're on email, you think, oh, I'll just quickly go through my archive and there their email pops up because you can do a, a search. And that's very different from how he might have had to retrieve that kind of information previously. It also means, for example, in terms of educational practices, that where there are digital technologies and connectivities, uh, school children are no longer necessarily taught to memorize large chunks of poems or literature or even you know, dates and historical events. It's largely about what you then do with that information, um, rather than teaching children to learn by rote bits of information. Because the information's all there, the knowledge is there somewhere in the cloud um, for us to access. And it also means that the actual language and metaphors that we use to describe our memories have changed. So when we wrote things down on wax tablets or things were recorded uh, in a particular way, we talked about recording our memories. Um, but with things like uh, digital memory, we talk about erasing our memories, that we've erased them in some way um, and that we save them in a particular way. So the actual software becomes implicated then in terms of the metaphors that we use to describe um, how we remember things and how we retrieve things. We talk about Googling things, you know, and that's a kind of corporate name that has become embedded in the very language practices that we deploy to talk about knowledge, to talk about retrieving information. Are you concerned about the pros and cons of this digital memory? I am, yeah. I mean, I think there's really good things that digital memory brings to us. And one of them is um, the capacity to change, uh, change the power relations in some ways for disenfranchised groups to capture memories that hitherto might have been missed. Um, so some of the work that I do, for example, looks at um, the websites and capturing of memories of the Roma community, the Gypsy community in Europe, which is the largest ethnic minority. It's uh, 11 million people in 21 different nation states in Europe alone, but also Gypsies are everywhere because they've been forced to move, they've been forced to migrate. So. You have them in Australia, you have them in Latin America, you have them in North America. Um, and it's really interesting then to see how, with the ease with which they can capture, they can video dances, poems, elements of culture, stories. And some of the stories are really horrendous. They're to do with oppression in different ways, to do with their experience of the Nazi Holocaust. And so these stories can connect together in new ways and a changing uh, how Roma, how Romani people perceive themselves. It changes their identity, I think, in a very positive way. And, co and cons? And cons? Well, I think the cons are to do with um, how much time we spend looking at screens. And that does concern me. Um, I think that, I mean, I find myself sometimes, you know, I have the television on, but I also have my iPhone and my iPad. And, uh, and it's like, how many screens can you have at once? And I do think there's an extent to which um, we have to also hang on to analog technologies. Um, another piece of research that I've been doing, for example, was looking at uh, a protest group in Malaysia who was campaigning against uh, a particular mining company that the protesters uh, believed that they would cause great pollution, cause radiation in their community. And 
the mining company wouldn't allow them to use any digital technologies to go into the site and they weren't allowed to take digital photographs of a report that the company had produced saying what they were going to do with the waste. So do you know what the people did? They resorted to pencil and pad and went in on a rotor of 30 people. They were allowed to sit there for an hour and write down as much as they could. And in that way, they got the document that they needed. Um, so I think that I think that kind of digital technologies can act as a fantastic facilitator for memories, uh, particularly for cultures that can be marginalised. But the actual performance of certain memories, the performance of songs, the readings, the reading of a material book, the learning of a poem, I, I still think is crucial to our sense of humanity. Why globalisation is a primary factor in digital memory discussions? Yeah, it's interesting. I think that very often, uh, certainly within media memory studies, uh, academics have talked about globalisation and digitisation for a long time as being separate. And the way in which I understand them and my research is kind of particularly around mobile phones has found that these two things work together. So you have digitization and globalization as synergetic dynamics that are changing human memory. And hence, I did what many academics do and they create a new word. So globital is the word that I've created to try and describe this, which is a a putting together of global with bit, which is the smallest contiguous sequence of data in computing. And it's difficult to say globital. In fact, I think it's easier in Portuguese. It sounds better. Globital. Um, is, it suggests an unevenness to this process because, of course, globalization is not even. Um, in the first world, it's experienced as a more even process in terms of people having access to digital technologies, multiple phones, multiple iPads, you know, it's, it's, it, we're kind of replete with those objects. Um, and connectivity is fast and it's easy to access, but that is not the same for everybody on the planet. And um, Globital is to suggest that these processes are uneven and they're experienced differently by different populations um, and within nation states in terms of classes and social class and in terms of social access and also po possibly in terms of, of gender and ethnicity and race as well. Why you say memory is fluid, polylogical and performative? Yeah, I mean, I said that memory was kind of fluid, polylogical and performative because I think for a long time, particularly within sociological explanations of uh, collective memory especially, the studies were done within the context very often of the nation state and the sense of national memories and a sense of memories being bounded and fixed and often they're kind of there was an object of analysis that people would look at. Um, it might be in terms of analysing a particular museum, for example, in terms of its artefacts and displays. Or it might be in terms of capturing stories of particular people. But again, the kind of researcher fixed them. And my view is that memory is not something fixed. It's always changing. And particularly so with digital media. It becomes an assemblage. Um, this interview, you know, once it goes wild on the internet, um, it will be hopefully, you know, tweeted and, and segmented and reused and, and that's, in my view, a good thing. You know, it, it allows it to, this, to escape into the wild in a way that previously uh, it was much slower for media memories to change. They often did remain static for longer except, I would say, in their, in their oral forms. Very often you see with oral communication and dance and performance that things were more fluid and it was the advent of the book, really, that fixed things in a particular way. 
um, that I then th think influenced how we sought to research them. How would you explain the concept of media memory to a Brazilian undergraduate class? And what examples would you give for them? I think media memory is a really important concept, um, which it, it's, it's actually quite an easy concept to come to grips with. I think the thing is to, to think of media memory as uh, having three different forms. One is in terms of the what Umberto Eco would call the organic, so it's the body, the human body in various forms. And then I think there's data, there's digital data, and then in addition to that there's things. And again, Umberto Eco would divide that into two. He would say there's the vegetal, which is things like paper and books, and then there's mineral memory. And mineral memory, of course, uh, is there in computers in the form of silicon, in the form of gold for connectors and connections, uh, in the form of rare earths such as europium. And these three different kinds of media memory have a long, long history. You know, I, I spent uh, almost two years in Australia and um, it was really important to me in terms of encountering the longevity of Aboriginal media memory. So there are, there's rock art in Australia that is 50,000 years old and that has been continuously scored and had ochre put on it again and again over all that time. And that's, that's media memory. That's in a sense the first media memory is our human beings making rock art, making songs, making dances. And now we have different forms of media memory, which are our digital images on our iPads, um, which are websites, uh, as well as legacy media, such as newspapers, books, television broadcasts, and so on. Um, but I, I guess I would also include within that sense of media memory as things, as material things, as also spaces and buildings. And, one of the things that really has really struck me in my very short time in Brazil so far is the significance of architecture. You know, there are some really beautiful buildings and some really amazing Brazilian architects that have that sense of a building being a memory space for a long time to come. Um, so it's the spaces we move through as well that are important, that are also media memories. What's memobilia and how important are mobile phones? I think mobile phones are, uh, are really important to uh, digital memory, to human memory now. That the big difference with the mobile phone is you can put it in your pocket, you can put it in your handbag, it lives with us and let's face it, when we don't have it with us we feel anxious now. Um, and I did a study with uh, students at London South Bank University, an institute that I used to work at, um, and they said that when they didn't have their mobile phones, they felt naked, they felt alone, they felt anxious, and then a few of them, interestingly, said they felt free. So there's a kind of mixed feeling that we have with our mobile phones, but they are a, a wearable memory prosthetic. Um, and they carry memories as mundane as, can you remember to get some bread, you know, to our partners on the way home, we text them. And it's there for a long, long time, can, as, along with, you know, I love you and all those other messages mixed up together. And then there are the images that we have on our mobile phones. And it's really interesting seeing how people will share images of their families in the workplace because they're on their phone. We wouldn't have done that 20 years ago. We didn't bring our family album into work, but we will happily share our images on our phones. And the technology provides a kind of protective space. It's okay to show your phone. Um, so the phone, I think, is very important. And then what's also changed uh, things is connectivity. So it's the fact that very, more and more spaces now, hotspots, we can connect through Wi-Fi. Um, 
it means we can very rapidly upload images that we capture to social networking sites. We can access archives of information. And what you then get is both memeabilia, which is this sense of particularly young people taking what in Britain are called selfies, so images of themselves, and they endlessly change them throughout the day and upload them and you know, worry about them. But it's about an identity practice. And then there's also what I would call weemobilia. So it's those are the memories that you might have often in collective situations. So in Brazil, it might be the carnival. You take photos of the carnival to share with people. Or it might be football that you take to share with people. But you also have weemobilia witnessing images of atrocity situations. So when there were the London bombings in 2005, the first thing that many people did was get out their phone and take photos because the journalists hadn't got there yet. And so more and more you see within mainstream news organisations the use of mobile phone images, um, which have a short shelf life. Um, the research that I've done shows that they, the images from the London bombings had all but disappeared five years later. So they don't stay and what you have instead are physical memorials to atrocity and death and grief which still remain important but nevertheless the mobile phone is, is still king or queen it seems to me in terms of being able to instantly capture uh, memories of events and share them. In this context, what happened with the boundaries between public and individual memory? Yeah, this is, I mean, this I think is a more troubling area of, of what is happening with connectivity more generally. And um, uh, I think it's really interesting, for example, that many parents choose to put up images of their children on Facebook. Um, I have two children, we have a policy in our family that we don't because our children cannot consent. So when they're 18, they can consent, yeah. But otherwise there's a data trail, a biography online that they have had, children have had no control over. Um, and that's very different from having a family album, it seems to me, where we take images of our children and they're shared by family members. Um, the other kind of changes I think that are interesting is through blogging and the shift from a private diary to writing for people out there in terms of our people's diaries and what that then means, which is this sense of always having to be in dialogue with another. And that can be good, but it can also be bad. I mean, where have those spaces gone which are self-reflective memory spaces that we, we believe to be private, where we can say those private thoughts that we wouldn't say to anybody else. Um, so I think that there are big shifts in terms of the private and the public, which we're still coming to terms with. Um, and we don't know yet the impact on us as human beings. Okay. <coughs> in Brazil, most women have prejudice against the term feminist. They think it refers to women with male attitudes when question equal rights, very much under the 60s phrase bra burning. They seem to forget all the achievements for better work conditions, maternal leave and so forth achieved by our grandmothers and great grandmothers. Do you think that view towards feminism is due to lack of cultural memory? Yeah, this is, I mean, I think the attitude that you're describing is not um, unique to Brazil, sadly. Um, I think it would also be one found in probably most countries. Um, and it's a shame because those struggles, those really important struggles to gain the vote, to gain access to education, to fight for equal pay, um, to fight for the right to work, actually, um, and be paid for it, I, I think have been really important struggles. 
And one thing that actually digital memory can and is providing, I think, is a better sense of archiving those struggles, many of which have got lost or only parts of them have been kept or remained. So, for example, in Britain, the suffragette movement, because it was um, had a strong constituency of middle and upper class women, richer women, they knew at the time, um, in the 1920s, that they should keep this information and so it was archived, it was stored and so there's a good record of those events. But the struggles of working class women, who were also important actually to the struggles for the right to the vote, for women who worked in unions to seek to have uh, decent wages, many of those have been lost but can now be regained through interviewing women, through digitising documents. And I think that's a really important process um, and will actually provide a sense of continuity, I think, to women and men that's important in terms of um, these massive shifts, actually, that, that we've experienced worldwide uh, in terms of some of the gains that some women have made. So, what are the implications of adopting cloud system as the main mode of two archives? Yeah, it's interesting with the, with the cloud system, I think. Um, I mean, one, I think, is that on some level, the metaphor itself uh, is vaporous. It suggests that it's not anywhere, that memory is not stored anywhere, and we can kind of not worry about it. But we do worry about it because we don't know where it is. And the fact of the matter is that the cloud is not a cloud. The cloud is a factory. The cloud is uh, made up of vast factories, uh, usually in rural areas, because you need a lot of land to actually store this information. Some of the sites, for example, for Google are so huge in terms of the land area, the, uh, the digital factories take up, they give their employees bicycles to be able to cycle around because it's so huge. And the cloud also um, guzzles up lots of electricity, uh, lots of material resources. They often uh, are in tension with local communities. They've often been imposed on, a, say, a small town because land is cheap and then it kind of changes that environment. So I think there are kind of material conditions that are there with the cloud that the archivist also needs to be aware of um, in terms of outsourcing memories because these outsourced memories are then owned very often by large corporations who can then have a power over over those memories if we're not careful. So, what would be your advice to a museum like this, Museum of Art Murilo Mendes, to preserve in digital media our literary and art, art archives? It's, yeah, that's a really good question. I think that um, my short time in Australia, I was really impressed with what the Australian government had done in terms of developing a system called Trove. And Trove allows for the digitization of objects in a particular way, which allows objects to be accessed through different local archives. Um, and it allows platforms to be linked together. The big problem, it seems to me, for digital information is A, long longevity, in that we often digitise uh, materials often without a sense then of how we will resource it in the future and it will require resources in the future and secondly con connections between resources so the best thing is if you can put in a query and it will connect you not just to your museum archive but to all the museum archives across Brazil 
And that's the system that they have in Australia, which I, I just found it to be brilliant and it was free, which is another important feature. Um, most of the research shows that it's much better for these things to be free for obvious reasons. Professor, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.